as we go forward. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you all for coming. So uh, as promised, I'm going to offer a little bit of my insider's view on how the media work and how we deal with science stories and uh, why when it comes to science, sometimes weird stories get a lot of press. I think in light of the uh, other journalist talk that some of us heard on Wednesday, I also want to try to make a case that some of us media types do have some redeeming qualities <laughs> and that uh, it's still okay to talk to us. And finally, I'm going to end with uh, a discussion of ways that I think that uh, scientists can work with us to improve public understanding of science and also to share the uh, excitement of uh, the work that you people do. So I also wanted to offer my slightly different take on uh, what Peter said about the media mindset or media logic. I think in, in the best uh, circumstances and at good publications that really people in the media are thinking about serving the general public and serving the public good. We're, we're not really thinking about serving scientists or uh, publicizing your work, but we are thinking about how to find information that's relevant and important to people. So uh, when it comes to science, we're going to look for stories that have an impact on health or public policy, uh, public funding and uh, environmental issues. And we're also going to look for things that we think will excite uh, the curiosity of regular people. And we try to uh, write stories in language that as many people as possible can understand. So uh, why, why bother with science reporters at all? I've, I've heard uh, or seen some discussions on some blogs and websites that are run by scientists where they say, you know, why don't we just do away with these guys? They're like middlemen. Maybe the scientists should just interact directly with the public. And uh, I have a lot of answers to that. One of them is that, uh, that suggestions of the like saying, well, why not have the uh, Philadelphia Police Department write all the stories about the police for the Philadelphia Inquirer? That, you know, they, the police are great and some of them are heroes, but I don't know if we really want them writing the stories. Or maybe uh, we should have the people who make movies write all the movie reviews, in which case everybody would get five stars. So, um, Actually, I put this up. This in, is uh, <laughs> this is uh, not really a, a, a shiny example of the best science journalism. But I put this up. I was kind of inspired because uh, when I go to new places and I tell people about uh, what I do, I often tell them that I spent uh, most of my career writing for a paper called the Philadelphia Inquirer. And sometimes people get this very uh, shocked look on their face and they say, well, you, you write for one of those stupid tabloids? And I, I say, no, no, no you, you should know your, your, super, your stupid supermarket tabloids. So there is a paper called the National Enquirer. Uh, and that, as far as I know, never covers science. I think they just do celebrities and gossip. I don't really read that too much. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> this paper. You think that's the story about the Hubble Space Oh, no, no. Oh, that's, now you've got it wrong. You've got it wrong. That's the weekly. That's this paper, the Weekly World News. This is the Weekly World News, separate paper, and uh, this one actually covers a lot of science. I think it's now defunct, but the, I think the main purpose of this paper um, is really to make fun of us, to make fun of science, and to make fun, especially, of people like me who write about science for newspapers. <laughs> And, you know, there's some discussion about whether the people who buy this paper actually uh, <laughs> actually believe what's in it. And um, that may... Uh, <laughs> they did the one about that boy? Oh, yeah, they did bad boy. Anyway, some, uh, it may depend on how hungry you are. He got, he got kind of excited. But... Nature or science believe what's in it? Uh, well, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll get to that because some of the weirdest stories that have come down the pike for us have actually been published in Science and Nature. They're a really good source of weird stories. <laughs> um, so this is the Philadelphia Inquirer. This is the paper that I uh, spent many years writing for. And um, I actually pulled this up on Google Images. I was really pleased that it was uh, a headline that uh, from a story I wrote at some point, though uh, I don't think it initially appeared way up at the top like that. I think it was on the front page, but further down, so I suspect one of those Penn Princeton people kind of nudged it <laughs> up a little bit. <laughs> but it should be there. It, it looks good there. Um, 
So I thought I'd back up and just give you sort of the five minute uh, version of how I fit into this picture and, and how I ended up uh, being one of these media people. So I, I initially thought maybe I would become a scientist or some kind of a writer. I ended up doing my undergraduate work at Caltech and I got out of there with a degree in geophysics but not a whole lot of direction in life. Um, luckily there was this really great program at UC Santa Cruz where they take uh, people with, with a science degree and uh, give us an introduction to writing. And then I, I sent some things to The Economist. They have a, a, an internship program there so I tried out for that. And the next thing I knew, I was in London writing for their science and technology section. I think that experience really gave me a very positive view of the way that science writing can be. And uh, one of the reasons for that is that um, I feel like there's, there's no contradiction at The Economist between stories that uh, are easy for anybody to read and stories that are smart. So when I hear the term, you know, dumbing down, or people say, well, do you really have to dumb stuff down? I point to The Economist and say, well, you know, there, anybody can understand their stories, but they're never dumb. And I think uh, one of the reasons for that is that the writers there often have a really broad background in the arts and politics and uh, history. And so they're able to put science stories in kind of a bigger human context. And I also think that the, uh, many of the writers there don't have to rely on hype because they have wit. So uh, those, unfortunately, I didn't get a permanent job at The Economist, so I had to come back to the United States. And uh, I wrote for a short time for Science News, and then I wrote for the journal Science for their news section. I had a really interesting beat there. They let me write about particle physics and cosmology. And uh, I really leaned on the uh, scientific communities in those areas to get me up to speed, to teach me all the things I needed to know to be able to understand the big questions in their area. But that was the early 90s, and the superconducting super collider was still on the table, so I got to write about the Higgs boson, what, you know, what other things people thought they would find with that when that was canceled. I wrote about the Large Hadron Collider, which people were thinking about building in Europe, and uh, there were all kinds of exciting things going on in cosmology. People were seeing patterns in the cosmic microwave background and using that to discern things about the origin of the universe. So uh, it was a great job. It was really exciting. Um, but it wasn't writing for the general public, which is what I had originally sort of set my mind to do. So uh, I was very happy to um, get an opportunity to uh, join the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, that was 1995, and back then uh, the Inquirer was actually a really big, powerful paper. It had about a half a million readers, and uh, it had bureaus all over the world. They had a great reputation for investigative reporting. When I uh, went to do my interview, they had a sort of whole corridor lined with pictures of people who'd won the Pulitzer Prize. So I was really excited about joining their team. But I also, now there it is. Uh, I also learned so that there were some kind of weird things about newspaper culture that I didn't expect. And uh, one of those was that you, you never write your own headlines. The headlines are written by somebody other than the person who writes the story. And that may seem strange, but it goes back to a time when uh, after all the stories were written and turned in, somebody had to lay them all out on the page. And then, only then, later in the evening, did you know exactly how many characters would be in each headline. So it was kind of a word puzzle to figure out how to say something that would have something to do with the story and also fit this exact number of characters. And by the time the end of the paper was all laid out, it was pretty late, so the people who actually wrote the stories were unlikely to be either sober or awake, so it wasn't uh, it wasn't such a bad idea to have somebody else do that. The other thing I, I found weird about writing for a newspaper was that um, I would turn in stories that were pretty similar to the ones that I had written for these other publications, and um, they'd get bounced back by editors who would say, "Well, this is all very interesting, but you have to tell people why they should care." And I thought, well, that's funny because I, on the sports section, they don't have to tell people in the second paragraph why you should care about football. And in the entertainment section, uh, you didn't have to tell people why uh, Lady Gaga or Lindsay Lohan were important. It was sort of understood. So I thought it was a bit of a double standard. But it did seem like that was kind of the way that newspapers 
Mm -hmm. uh, it was the way they were structured and the way stories are structured. They actually called the second paragraph where you told people why things were important the nut graph. And I never really understood that except maybe it makes people nuts to have to do it. <laughs> and you can probably, I think that, that it, it leads to a kind of a formulaic thing that you sometimes see in science stories where uh, you have a second paragraph that says, if this discovery is confirmed, it will change everything about the way scientists see X field, or if this discovery is confirmed, it will lead to a cure for X disease and X disease. Did the Enquirer have the analog of the Science Times, like a special day? Maybe? We did, yes, we did. In fact, we had, they still have that, though it's getting smaller and smaller and it's changing. But we had one on Mondays, the Health and Science section, which was really nice because then that was a home for stories that wouldn't necessarily have enough news impact to be on the front page, but were still, I think, of a lot of interest. And it also gave readers who liked science a chance to sort of look for science. So they, they kind of started to go further from science and more into health as time went on and focus groups. I told them that that's what people wanted, though I'm not sure that that is really what people want. Um, and even this, you know, this story sort of gets at this formula because, you know, you think, well, they, they found heaven with the Hubble. That ought to be exciting enough, but they still have to uh, say that the divine image stuns NASA just to make sure people understand the impact. And also there's another piece of our formula there that's sort of onto here that right after that there's always a, some kind of quote, you know, very stock kind of quote about how exciting it's here. It's, we found where God lives, say scientists. So, so uh, these guys are, yes, they are definitely onto us. Um, but I think there are ways that I've found to sort of work within the system. And uh, it helps to understand the different types of stories. There are a couple of different species of story that we do. And um, the most common one that deals with science is the feature story. And feature stories are the types that well, it isn't about something that just happened, but uh, it's often identifying a trend or trying to explain a, an emerging idea. Sometimes a feature can be a profile of a, a subfield of science that is interesting that people don't know much about or an institution or a person. And another kind of feature that I think can be really important are features where uh, a science writer tries to get the scientist's input on some area of, of public policy or public interest. So, um, so one example, um, back uh, in the early 2000s in the, the lead up to the Iraq war, there was a lot of talk about uh, weapons of mass destruction. And that discussion was really started by politicians and policy people, but there were scientists who, uh, who knew a lot about that because they were on uh, weapons inspection teams. They had been to Iraq. And so it was really important, um, and more people should have done it, uh, to have science writers uh, interview those people and get their perspective because they were able to uh, bring uh, evidence and logic to a discussion that had mostly been uh, run by, you know, on the, on the uh, sort of the strength of authority. I think a another type of story where uh, it was important to get scientists involved was something, an issue called Climate Gate, which uh, started with somebody hacking into the emails of uh, a group of climatologists. And, you know, this whole dis it, this discussion got out there because of mostly this sort of uh, political type discussion. And it was, I think in that case, it was really important for science writers not only to discuss whether these guys actually uh, did anything wrong that was exposed in these emails, which they didn't, but also to explain that the connection between human activity and climate change didn't hinge on these couple of people. That even if they were discredited, that this is something that goes way back, that there's a big body of evidence that comes from a lot of different fields. So I think it was also important for um, science writers to get involved and bring in uh, different voices from different fields of science to weigh in on that. So uh, another type of uh, common story. And that, one, that, one, was that one where a lot of the science writers felt compelled to have both sides of the story and find someone, however, who would um, keep the other side of the 
Some might have, some might have, especially because I, at that point, the, I mean, Fox News was out there. I think I didn't feel compelled to do that at all. In fact, the first story I wrote was just a backgrounder about climate change and why, I, you know, it, it rested on more than the shoulders of these people. So you, I mean, in order to write about it, you have to tell people, you know, even when you debunk things, you have to explain what the bunk is in order to debunk it. So I don't consider that false balance. That's just sort of explain, putting the issue on the table so that people understand it. So you do have to back up and say, you know, these people were hacked and they were accused of doing all these bad things, but, you know, there's no, no basis to it. But I don't think, I didn't feel like I was under any pressure to have to talk to uh, people on the other side. Though I did get one really interesting interview with a guy named Patrick Michaels, who's one of the few people who actually has a PhD who's in the, uh, the conservative think tank world. And I asked him, well, all right, so you've got all these emails. Tell me the worst thing in there, like the worst thing that was exposed about these guys. And he'd say, well, you should just read them. You know, there's so many. And I said, no, you, you're the one who's making a big deal out of this. I want, I want you to tell me what the worst thing was. And he, he got off the phone and he went away and then he came back, he called me back and he said, well, it was that uh, Michael Mann and uh, Phil, oh God, I can't remember his name, that these two guys had nominated each other for an AGU fellowship. And, and I said, well, that's not much. Like, you're really going to create some international scandal? Out of it. That's it? That's the best you got? And it really, it, you know, he kept saying, well, but don't you think that's unethical? And I said, I have no idea. It really depends on the culture of your field, but not necessarily. So sometimes you really, you do want to call those people just to try to pin them down because uh, that can be very telling. I mean, often they don't have as much to say as you would think, and especially when you try to ask them really critical questions. Okay, so, uh, oh, weekly columns, that's where we were. So weekly columns, um, they uh, are often distinguished by the fact that they show up in the same part of the paper every week or sometimes a couple of times a week and they'll sometimes have a little headshot of the writer and they're, they're written in a little different form. So usually the, the writers are able to use their own voice and bring in a lot of background and context. They don't have to have that, why, why should you care about this so much? So I've always thought that weekly columns were a great way to uh, popularize science and to get discussions about science out there. Um, um, I don't seem to have that much agreement. I, I, there aren't very many weekly science columns, and I fought with the Enquirer editors for a long time to get a science column, and they kept kind of putting me off, putting me off. And finally, they did get a, a, a new uh, editor for the Health and Science desk, and she said, okay, well, okay, I'll give you a column, but I really want it to be a sex column instead of a science column. <laughs> and I, I, um, I didn't know what to say. I, I, I'm usually more the kind of person that like needs advice about relationships than should be giving advice, but, um, <laughs> yes, well, actually, I, this was sort of, I, uh, she wasn't doing that column yet, and I had the same thought that she did, which is, you know, there's a lot of science, I mean, there's a lot of science, you could write a lot of things about, you know, uh, why sex evolved and how, and how, uh, you know, sexual dimorphism came about in different species, and how sexes are here, and why are there two, and why are there sometimes more than two, so, there are actually a lot of really interesting questions. So that's what I ended up doing. I ended up turning it into kind of a science column. Though my hope was that they would eventually let me do a more general science column. They sort of see the light and I could prove I was a really good column writer and then they would they would let me do what I wanted. But this, the sex column was actually pretty popular and so I had a really hard time getting rid of it. And I got stuck with it for like three years before I could finally <laughs> convince them um, that uh, I should do something else. And this is actually, this this is the uh, the logo uh, for my second column, which was about evolution, and it was a kind of a collaborative effort between me and Tony Auth, who's a uh, political cartoonist, one of the people on that row of Pulitzer winners, and he also turned out to be a really good uh, science illustrator, so he drew art for uh, these columns. Actually, he still works with me for my uh, new uh, web project at WHYY. So this uh, it was uh, the theme was evolution, or endless topics, and uh, yes, we called it Planet of the Apes. So that was lots of fun. So Faye, when you were at the Enquirer, how many science writers were there? Well, there was just me for a while, but I was part of a desk, so they had me, and they had three between three and four medical health writers, and then they had a, an environment writer. And then when I was really sort of involved in, in this column, they brought in someone else who did some science and some health. So, so those were all full-time people? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I still, even when I was writing the sex column and this column, I was still responsible for writing. If something in, broke in the news, I would still have to write it if it was in science. And usually I wanted to, because you know, it was sort of fun to jump on science stories. And they still expected a certain number of stories for the front page. So uh, even with these columns, there was, uh, yeah, they, they keep us busy. And how many health and science writers are there now? Uh, very few. Uh, <laughs> there are very few, and they're doing mostly health, which is, I, you know, I, uh, I have disagreements with them. I had disagreements with them about how they covered health because they thought that people wanted things that were short and snappy, but they didn't do a lot of research. So they, you know, they, it, I felt like we were having too many little briefs and things with that were mostly, re, you know, uh, rewritten press releases and not really reported stories. I mean, health is important, and I think that it is important for us to report on things that are relevant to people's health, but the, the reporting is the critical thing, not just rehashing stuff. Uh-huh. How about uh, the online media? Is there more room for that in the online media? There is, actually, which is, you know, and I'll get to that at the end, because that's really what I'm doing now. So I, my artist friend and I both ended up leaving the Inquirer, and we um, joined uh, the public radio station in Philadelphia, WHYY, and they have a website which is really becoming a competitor to the Philadelphia Inquirer's website. And it's kind of fun being on the this sort of new uh, upstart team and trying to build something. Um, and so there is a lot of room. You know, we, so we, I have a, a kind of a hybrid. It's a blog, but I try to construct it more like a column where I do real research. And you know, the problem is people come to blogs with an expectation that there isn't going to be a lot of uh, background and research there. But, but I'm, I'm hoping maybe that'll change. So this leads to the third type of story, I think the most problematic one, and this is the breaking news story. And this image is a uh, meteorite from Mars, and I first became acquainted with this one uh, summer late afternoon, and I think it was 1996. I, I'd been out all day reporting on another story, and I, I came back, it was about six, six in the evening, uh, and there's a little post-it note on my desk, and it said, before you go home, can you please check into this life on Mars thing? And I, <laughs> and I, I, I uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, and this was before you could just Google your way out of a, of a predicament like this. So, <laughs> um, so I I had to check into this thing. I was kind of hoping like maybe it wouldn't be uh, too big of a deal. I didn't really think there would be life on Mars, but I did have to check into it. And the final like absolute deadline is somewhere around 8:30 or 9 for stuff that's you know just breaking. So it turned out that in fact the journal Science, my former employer, was in fact publishing a paper by a team of people at NASA and Stanford saying um, that uh, there had been life in this rock and that the rock had come from Mars and that they had a couple of different lines of uh, what they thought was evidence for this. And and the way I really dealt with the story, I mean, these are times when I think uh, you need kind of the literary equivalent of error bars in a story. So, so you know, <laughs> you, uh, you know, I mean, I did know a lot of things by the time I got off the phone. I mean, I was lucky because I, I knew people at Science, so I could call them and say, like, are you really going to do this? And they said, well, yeah, kind of, you know. <laughs> we're, we're not sure how well it's going to end for us. But so uh, I knew that they had pretty good evidence that the rug did come from Mars, and I knew that they really were going to uh, published this in science. I knew uh, where the researchers came from. So I had a, I had some information. What I didn't know was whether there actually was life on Mars. But, you know, the, the, the trick to dealing with a story like that is not to try to guess. Just tell people what you know and then, you know, leave this vast uncertainty there. I think that uh, that this story was actually covered pretty responsibly by most of the press, and um, it also gave a lot of us a really nice teachable moment. So that subsequent, because it it generated so much interest that we were able to write stories about the uh, geologic history of Mars, sort of the the question of the plausibility of life having uh, ever arisen there, and even this really interesting question uh, that biologists have about the fact that we have a sample size of one with life here on Earth that we have all life had a, a single origin and it would be we'd really learn a lot and be better at defining what life is if we had some other example. So so there were all kinds of really interesting uh, stories that could be done, you know, kind of banking off the public interest that was generated by this. Uh-huh. Were you an active reporter during the cold fusion? 
I was actually just starting out. I was that was I was doing an internship at Science News, and so uh, I did not cover that for Science News. My uh, colleague, I think Ivan Amato, covered it. And I think he did a pretty good job. But Science News, you know, it's it's probably the least flashy science publication out there. You know, I don't think it suffers from the paranoid style. It's it's pretty unparanoid kind of magazine. So I, I think that they covered it pretty well. I mean, that was a real lesson to a lot of science writers that you, know, you have to be careful. Um, though in that case, you know, there was no major journal publishing it, and these guys were kind of out of left field. So uh, yeah, that was just a little before my time. Would you talk about arsenide-based DNA story more? Yes. Oh, that's coming next. <laughs> I can't wait. Yes, that one is uh, um, because that one. In fact, this is I. This is I couldn't find a screenshot of our paper um, when this came out, so uh, I found uh, this one. But this story, I think, really, this is you know, 14 years later, and I think this story was not done as well. That this did not play out well. It didn't start well. It didn't end well. Um, from the very beginning, there was a press release that went out that said uh, NASA was holding a press conference on a finding of astrobiological importance. And to me, this was seemed like no big deal at all because uh, NASA holds a lot of press conferences and they also support a whole astrobiology group. So of course, it's kind of assumed that NASA would think that the things these guys are doing for them is of astrobiological importance, or why would they even be funded? Uh, but by that point, you know, a lot of the online media was was being presented by people who weren't reporters, who weren't journalists, who had no experience, and so they didn't they didn't know that NASA routinely has press conferences or that they have a whole astrobiology group. So they just assumed that NASA had found aliens. And, and so this, this massive internet rumor went around in the day before the press conference that they were going to announce that they had aliens. And I thought, well, you know, um, this situation will, will improve when they actually have their press conference and people find out what it really is. And in fact, I think that NASA made the situation a lot worse. And I don't really know why they did this, but in their press materials and their press releases in here at this press conference, they kept talking about the shadow biosphere, which was supposedly this, you know, never yet seen other tree of life that had a separate origin and that somehow mysteriously no one had ever found evidence for. And so a lot of people that were watching this press conference or trying to report on it just assumed that this thing, this uh, bacteria, well, actually, I should back up, right? The announcement was that they found a type of bacteria that incorporated arsenic where the phosphorus was supposed to be in its DNA. So, um, you know, that's, that would be kind of interesting if it were true. It wasn't really clear it was true. That and, even, it and it was published in Science. It was published in, yes, the same journal, right? So it was published in Science. And, uh, but press conference was before the, the publication or after the publication? It was, it coincided with it. It coincided with it. it, yeah. So. It did get refereed. It got refereed, and I think, from what I heard, uh, the reason that it uh, that it actually passed peer review is because the people who reviewed it were astronomers and not biologists. Yeah, I know. Well, when you have astrobiology, you know, I guess they just thought, oh well, let's see. I bet the astronomers will like this better than biologists. So, and they did. Um, and actually, that was, I think, that. <laughs> I know, and they 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 didn't retract it. It was interesting, and I've talked to them about why they didn't retract it. Um, but, you know, it, it, it wasn't even, it, the reason it got such big headlines in the popular press was really this shadow biosphere thing, you know, which kind of banked off the aliens rumor. And I don't really know, it, that really didn't have anything to do with it one way or another, but that that uh, got a lot of, uh, got got it out there. And as a, as a reporter with a lot of context in the biology world, it really wasn't very hard for me to put it in perspective. I mean, just listening to this, it's like your BS detector is is going, you know, is going off. But I, you know, I called a few people and they they were doubtful. I mean, the shadow bias fear thing was just silly, but they were also doubtful about the claim that they got any arsenic in the DNA at all. And so, um, you know, it was pretty easy for me to see what was, you know, what was wrong with this. But the problem here was that I think by this point, this was late 2010, that um, the media world had moved online and most of the people presenting science to the public were not reporters. Some of them were scientists. 
-hmm. And some of them were grad students, and some of them were science undergrads who thought they <laughs> knew what they were talking about. And I think even some prominent uh, scientists slash bloggers uh, just bought into it because they don't know how to make phone calls and check into things. Uh -huh. People at this press conference were card-carrying biologists? Well, actually, uh, you know, it was interesting. If you watch the, this, is still, it's still on YouTube. I mean, she's uh, head of astrobiology at NASA. She totally bought into it. I'm not sure if she, she bought into it. This is Steve Benner, who I've interviewed at length about this. And he, you know, he was skeptical from the beginning. He knows this field. But he, you know, he came in and he introduced himself as sort of the resident skeptic that they brought in to throw cold water on us. So people sort of assumed that, oh, well, he's, he's you know, what he should have said is, I'm the guy that actually knows this stuff that I'm in this field and I understand you know I can I can actually tell you why this is wrong but that's not how he presented himself and you know some of it is it's, it's scary to be in front of all these people you know I, I think uh, he when he talked to the press later he was pretty clear but but nobody should have been reporting straight out of this press conference you know the way to do it is to go back and call some people I mean I was calling people before it was even over because it was such an annoying press conference <laughs> and people I had people on the phone saying you know oh my god like I can't believe that they're doing this but, but they did it, and uh, it, uh, you know, it, it got huge headlines. And I think most of the people who, uh, who played it up were not real reporters. Well, but I think the, the key issue is still that it got into science. It got into science, not the shadow biosphere thing, though. They really, I mean, they made this sound like it was the right. biggest discovery ever. I'm not sure the general public would have been that excited about a thing that a couple of arsenic stuck in its DNA. I mean. It's also published cold fusion. Yes. No, 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 no. They, science didn't publish cold fusion, I don't think. I'm pretty sure science. I'm going to check that. I, you're, they may have covered, they may have published, not the, not the Pons and Fleischmann initial oh, thing. I think they, I thought they published the, uh, you know, some of the follow-ups that, that where people weren't able to replicate it. And also where they did replicate it. Or some oh, okay. The discussion was the argument. Okay. And also, also and they published Yes. I think there are two things that are being confused here. One of which is pathological science in general, which has existed as long as science has been there. <coughs> which, I mean, there, of course, physics today did everyone a great favor by reprinting that wonderful article of Langmuir's on pathological science. And after it was published, there were people saying, no, no, that wasn't pathological. I still believe in it 40 years after it had been disproved about many of the things. But that's a separate issue from how you present science. And so yes. I, I just want to understand what you're focusing on, which is. This is, the, yeah, the more, this is really about the presentation of science, you know, the, the way that they, I think, misled the, the public in, you know, even if what they were claiming in the paper was true, they also misled the public in the press conference, in their press materials. They also created what I call a false narrative. I think maybe, maybe Peter would call it the, the paranoid style, but, you know, NASA had this version of the story where the scientific community was just, like, too stupid and too stodgy to recognize that you could have this really exotic kind of life, and then you had this young maverick researcher come in and set everybody straight. That made a very appealing kind of tale, you know, but that was not the press that made that up. That was that was the NASA PR machine and then a lot of other people that, that bought into it because they thought it made for a good story. There's a wonderful um, quote which is useful on this, which I think is from the editor of the New York Times when asked if John McCarthy had a list of communists in the State Department. And he said, I try to keep an open mind, but not so open that my brain falls. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. This was this. Yes, exactly. And actually, I mean, there were so many people that were doing interesting work in this general area. And so that whole narrative was just so wrong, you know. So I think of that as the false narrative. And, and there, you know, there really is a powerful PR machine behind a lot of these things. And, and they know what types of stories that, uh, you know, bloggers and other people will pick up. The New York Times actually covered this, and I thought it, they, they had Dennis Overby cover it, and he's more of an astronomy writer, and it, it was, his story wasn't horrible. It was, it was okay. It had some of the uncertainty, but it, it, uh, it wasn't one of his better stories, and so that also got, I think, uh, a little bit, he, he was not quite skeptical enough. by a society.
Yes. Yeah. And therefore, the media as such, well, it, yeah, in a way, it, it helps. So I think when there were more uh, critical science writers on the ground, you you know, I, to me, if something's published in science, it doesn't mean it's true at all. So, uh, you know, I yeah, rather the other way around, probably these days. <laughs> so, and you know, <laughs> yes, yeah, they're similar. You know, there's, I think, science and nature are similar in that way, and that they're they they are incredibly prominent. They 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 send uh, reporters every week a little cheat sheet of all of their favorite articles, hoping that we'll, you know, kind of bite on them. So they've got their their bait for us. Yes. Well, somebody actually they have somebody writes the yeah. But it's I mean it's often most fashionable thing to say oh well science nature they're never right but if you but people have actually done studies on this and look at the, at the cutting edge of research a fair fraction of things don't turn out to be right in the end. And yes. That goes across many journals. And it, and, it, and it just so happens that nature and science try to only publish those things. Yeah. It, I don't think that it's symptomatic of, of just those two Well, Because uh, nature prides itself in not having a scientific advisory board, chief editor of nature. But why is this bad? I don't understand why this is a bad situation. They, if NASA has formed publicizing and funding nutty things. They spent $15 million on Neil Kladnikoff anti-gravity device. Uh, and how much they could have saved if it worked. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. So, 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 as a substitute for phosphorus is not a totally lunatic concept. No, it's not. So the idea that you could find an organism that had arsenic, used, used arsenic, wasn't crazy. You don't have enough information to be able to make decisions, but it's, a, it's something that the way they spin it is another question. Yes. But of course, they're doing it because they're a politically funded agency that has to be in the public eye in order to get money. Right. I just think that, you know, my job as a reporter is to try to get at what's really going on and get at the truth. And when I see this, I say, okay, well, that may may not be the truth. But I think because science is being reported by a lot of people who are not reporters, they just say, oh, well, if it's in, you know, if it's here, it must be true. So there's just a different approach. I mean, I don't think, oh, NASA's evil because they did this. I just think, well, there, there's a lot that's wrong going on here. There's a lot, there are a lot of things being said in this press conference that aren't true. And as a reporter, it's my obligation to find out what of this is true and what isn't and what actually happened because that's that's my job as a as a uh, science reporter. But in the beginning you promised you would tell us what we can do about it. Yes, in fact, yes, I, and I will get to that. And I'm all actually, yes, okay, so I'll move past this because we can we can talk about that all day. But um, this uh, this is uh, the last example I'll give. This is the the, uh, the Higgs boson story, a pretty recent story, um, broke uh, last summer. And uh, it was uh, it was actually announced that it was going to be announced on the 4th of July, which is kind of an inconvenient day for a lot of us here in the United States who want to go out and have a picnic or something. <laughs> yes, it's not here, but they should have thought they could have thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually offered uh, to take my holiday and, and work, and I told the editors at the Inquirer, you know, I have a long history with this because I work for science, and I've written about the Higgs boson way back in the early 90s, and so, and I and I had followed this, you know, this big contingent of, of physicists at Penn and at Princeton who were involved in this work, and um, I said, you know, but I'm only going to do it if you put it on the front page, which is where it belongs, you know, I'm going to take my holiday off to write some story that you bury somewhere, and, and they came back and said, well, you know, why don't you just go enjoy your holiday, we don't really understand this stuff, and so, you know. I don't think it's going to make the front page. And so I, I went home and I uh, did my thing. I actually wrote a little blog post from, I have had a science blog then, um, 
in the morning, and then I went off. And then um, the next day, there was a huge headline on the top of the Philadelphia Inquirer. It said Higgs boson found. And I, so I, I went in and I went to the executive editor's office because I was a little upset by this. It was an AP story. I didn't think it was as good as the one I would have written. And I said, well, what, what gives here? Why did you change your mind? And he said, oh, I, I heard it was the God particle. And then I was really intrigued. <laughs> and um, I guess he, uh, he did not read the blog post that I had written that morning. Where I, I, I'd already written a lot about the Higgs, but I, I kind of made fun of it. This is, this is actually my cat, who, who uh, my editor helped me name him. His name is Higgs. And he, uh, he blogs for me a lot. He writes about evolution and, and uh, you know, trying to look at it from the perspective of another species. And because of his name, I also have him also write about physics. And uh, so he's quoted in this saying um, that uh, every time I hear the term God particle, I bring up a hairball. So, uh, and uh, he was actually uh, not alone in having a negative reaction to that. I, I wish I could take credit for this. It, it made the rounds uh, sometime that day. So, you know, some people might call the, you know, this whole God particle thing the paranoid style. I think it's just sort of a, the part of my editor kind of small-mindedness and lack of sophistication. Who the Leon Letterman. Leon Letterman. Leon Letterman. Yeah, I know. Not the media. Yeah, yeah. And then he had this story that he told over and over about how he really wanted to call it the goddamn particle. And he must have told that a thousand times. <laughs> anyway, yes, no, but I think physicists are actually a lot worse than journalists for gratuitous uh, invocations of God and heaven in order to uh, promote. But there was a paper in Physical Review Letters co authored by physicists and the cats. Oh, really? Oh, okay. So uh, my cat's not the only one that writes about it. That's D.C. Willard. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> cats are, cat, you know, cats make good sort of alternative voices. And uh, anyway, so, okay, so here's the part that I, I promised to get to at the beginning about uh, how uh, you can help and how uh, I think scientists can uh, can collaborate with us journalists. And and one thing that has really been helpful to me is that I have a lot of um, sort of behind the scenes people, I call them sources, they could be advisors, people I really trust in different fields so that when something happens in the uh, world of science, I can call them and get a little bit of a reality check, often get suggestions for people I can call, or they at least give me people I can call who know people I can call. And eventually I find my way to the people who actually know something about uh, what's going on. And so I, uh, I rely on those people a lot, and I find them all, all different ways. Sometimes from a story I've written, uh, sometimes because I made a mistake in a story, and they call me and they say, "You've got this wrong," and I say, "Well, you'll, maybe you could help me uh, get it right in the future." And that brings me to yeah the second point. I mean, if you see something in the paper that you like or where there's a mistake, uh, reporters really do want to hear from you. We we want to know uh, when we get things wrong. And I've uh, my answer to people. I mean, if they don't yell at us too loud, is to say, well, you know, you could help me in the future if I write about this topic again. Maybe you could could uh, fact check my story for me. You know, I could send it to you, and you could make sure that I I don't make a mistake like that because mistakes are kind of an occupational hazard for people like me because we deal with so many different fields of science and we're jumping into things that we don't have that much background in and because there are a lot of facts in science stories there are more facts to get wrong you look at other types of stories really are, are, are fewer actual facts in them Do, um, you would react possibly to that but would you say that most science writers would or Oh yeah, I mean, as well, if the per if you really did make a mistake, you you want to know. I mean, you definitely want to know. I definitely want to know if I made a mistake in a story. I guess if someone's just going to call and yell at me and say you're an idiot. I mean, when I was writing that sex column, it was kind of controversial, and people would call and just yell at me and say, I can't believe you're writing about sex in the in a family newspaper. You know, I would just like scream and yell, and so that that was sometimes a little disturbing. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we have the experience not directly on science thing, but having a reporter what the what in a quote, and I said, I want to make sure it's out of context. Can you please send me the, the articles that come to me out of context? And, and they'll say no. Well, sometimes, now there are reasons for that. Quote, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, there are, there are, that's tricky, though, because say if I'm uh, writing a story where I've got three or four different people and they totally disagree with each other, you know, they, which often happens because, they, you know, everybody looks at things differently and there are, there are conflicts and controversies in science. And so if I show it to scientist A but not to B and C, well, is that really fair to B and C if they find out that A got to actually read the whole story and they didn't get to see it? So 
you kind of either have to show it to one or show it to everybody. And my solution is sometimes just to read back the sections, you know, uh, over the phone that people are in. Um, and the other solution is to find Scientist D, who's not in the story at all, to read it. But we all know the outcome of that, which is you always get mad at what somebody is said to have said in the newspaper. So a good rule is you should never blame people for what it says in the popular press because it's always kind of... Um. I don't know. I mean, I I, I usually uh, get positive reactions from the people I quote and write about. I mean, almost always. I you know. I usually, I rarely get people mad about that. It's usually some really trivial, stupid mistake I make where I, I mix up something. I say A is bigger than B when I meant to say, you know, some kind of brain mistake that you make. So it's usually something really trivial, but not a misquote. The worst thing with quoting is not misquoting, but taking. It's the context. Taking one or two words, I yeah, I actually don't like using direct quotes, and the Economist rarely uses them. And I, you know, and I, I, I like the fact that they rarely use them because I, I think that quotes. I mean, sometimes someone just says something so clever, and it would be, you know, it would be immoral for me to take credit for it. So it really does deserve to be in quotes. So sometimes I think that there, there are good uses of quotes, and usually when people say something like that, they're, they're glad to see it in the paper because they know it's clever and they, you know, they're happy about that. But there's some, I mean, on Armstrong's over there, John Pike used to get quoted much more than anyone else. And I was at a meeting where this you know, sort of came up stealing reporters, and he said it was very simple. Anytime a reporter called up to, to ask about something, he would get a sense of what they wanted to ask about, and then he'd say, let me call you back in 15 minutes, and then he would think about good things that would make quotes. Well, and you get a round of all that. that's and you know that's it's actually not a bad general idea because you you can do that if someone calls you and says I want to interview you 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 can say you not know, not so much for quotes but just to really think through what you want to say you can ask all kinds of questions about what the story is about what type of a story it is who else is in it I uh, you know what they've learned so far I mean reporters want to be transparent and we don't want you to be unpleasantly surprised we really want you to be pleasantly surprised and pleased with the outcome. Uh huh. So uh, what you're telling us is how to avoid and correct uh, or correct uh, wrong things that can be written or hyped up and so on. But what is I really find it difficult, uh, really in daily life, is how to get uh, journalists interested in good things without hyping them up, without uh, bringing God into game. <laughs> yes. Uh, and how can I do that if uh, the, you know, your chief in your newspaper is some idiot that will only react if uh, you say God? Well, that's, I mean, some of that is, I, uh, it is a problem with front page uh, news, and I, you know, I don't work for a newspaper anymore, and, and some of the way I've worked around that is to have my own column, because when you have a column, then, then it's up to the science reporter and not up to the people that uh, have the power. And also, uh, you know, now I'm at WHOY, I have my own blog, and so, I mean, blogging, it, it's good and bad, you know, blogging, uh, a, a lot of it isn't, it's pretty shoddy, but having a blog does give the writer a lot of power, because if I think something is just interesting, and then then I can write about it, or I can write about what is interesting about the... But yeah. this is an answer for you. I'm not a journalist, I don't have a blog, so how can oh, no, I get a mean... journalist involved and interested in some good story? Without sex, sex. I think that's the you know I think that's the the, the beauty of having feature stories and columns. Yeah, exactly. As a scientist. Yes. Yeah. They, you, you would like it for a journalist to be able to. I'm interested in. I'll talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> I think what you're doing sounds really. Identify uh, a writer who writes a column or writes okay. features and columns. Yeah, that's uh, some of that. Yeah. You write your own thing. It seems to me I have this thing. It's really important. What do you think? You want to do a feature? Maybe that would be one way. Yeah, that's one way. Also, uh, if you do have a public relations person in you know in your university you can convince them to write a press release that uh, and a lot of people uh, you know if it, uh, a lot of journalists really do see through the stupid press releases you know the god particle and stuff and they they we are interested in interesting press releases and i think that that uh, you know what you do is really interesting i could see it as a as a great magazine story so i the press people may not be able to see they may not be able to, they may have trouble making, they can be part of the problem, they can be, but I guess, uh, you know, it's it's better to try to work with them and because they, they uh, get the word out. Also, I think the American Institute of Physics has some people that send out things that, and that are pretty good and that there's a 
there are people I've worked with over there. There's a guy named Phil Shuey who's really good, and they they actually have some some really. Uh, I think the the uh, AIP has some really good uh, people that that kind of work as intermediaries between us and the physics community. But, you got, but it's a legitimate question. You, you started out with a very promising title for all the young people. In the, <laughs> the old people in the audience will say, we get too much press, we don't like the press we get. Most people in this audience probably are young enough that they, they, they think about the producers. You have a great, you know, you say, I think that's a great scheme. What scheme? So the question is here, I'm a young scientist, my department chairman comes to me and says, you know, if you're gonna get tenure, you gotta get noticed. And so now I've just published a boring paper on yet another thing on prisoner's dilemma in PLOS One. And I have to write a press release that is gonna get this thing out there. And I'm totally cynical. And I wanna write a press release that is going to live up to your the promise of how you're going to help people, which is how to write a weird enough press release that people notice it, even though there isn't actually much in it. How do I do it? Well, that seems to me this is a this is a problem with this, you know this is no it's not no you're yeah I think that there are there are actually responsible people and there are good publications that would I mean I wrote about quantum cryptography for the for uh, the Economist so and they that story actually was it was very challenging for me and for the people I interviewed I had to interview everybody involved in it like twice or even three times so I mean your field is a difficult one but it it can be popularized and sometimes it just takes a lot of back and forth and, and time and I was actually really happy and I think the scientists were really happy with the way that story came out even though I had to pester them a number of times before we were all sure that it was accurate. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I mean, some of it really is, it may be a cultural thing. I think it is, you know, the idea that, that the writers use wit instead of hype to get, and I, you know. <laughs> You know, I mean, a lot of the British press actually uses a lot of hype, so they tend to be, I mean, they, I, you look at new scientists, they have some good content, but their headlines are usually, uh... They often do have experts writing everything, I have known scientists that write the science articles that are really And they're really good editors, you know, I mean, in a way, I think the New Yorker does too, that they, that... So they, they, yeah, that things get sort of go through the mill, and they, and there's also the the Economist actually had something they they uh, called it boffinizing your story, and you the way you boffinize a story is you send it or read it over the phone to somebody a boffin in the relevant field, not necessarily someone who was in the story or who the story was about, but somebody else, and so that was actually part of the procedure for them. And a lot of newspapers tell you like, don't do it, you know, don't show your story to people before. But I think for science, it's really important that you do it. And so when I came back from The Economist, I thought, well, I think I should always do it unless there's unfairness, you know, just as long as I do it in a fair way, so that I, if I'm uh, covering controversy, I don't show it to somebody, you know, on one side and not the other side. But that it is really important to, and it gives you confidence, because then, I mean, I'm taking things out of the language that you're used to using and putting it in language that regular people can understand. And to do that, you know, you can do that more if you're confident that you're not screwing it up, and you get confidence by having other people look at it and then they'll say well this is pretty good you know this one isn't quite right and you know they, and then you you uh, you know you can uh, take a lot more leeway of um, interpretation there, there's an elephant in the room that's come up a little bit but, but only tangentially so that NASA press conference was justified by someone in the audience by saying well they have to get this next funding cycle and they have to uh, you know promote this and so forth to get the funding that might work in the short term, but long term, if there are too many stories like this, the public and the Congress that are paying the bills at the NSF and at NASA are going to say enough is enough. And I've, I've been told by friends in molecular biology that uh, when the NIH budget doubled, the promises were we'll, we'll cure this disease, that disease, and the other disease. Those diseases are still not cured. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the Genome Project did a, you know, well, they did the NIH. Uh, because the, the long term uh, promises were not kept. Well, and this is, you know, this is where, this goes back to the beginning of my talk, where I would say that, you know, that you people and people like me in the press have some interests in common, but but not completely. You know, if I'm also partly your adversary, that your goal might be to promote yourselves and get more funding. And my goal is to try to get the truth to the people. And that overlaps some of the time, but not all of the time. And so, 
I, you know, that that I addressed at the beginning. You're slightly different uh, uh, issue, which is the background of my question, uh, namely, namely that often we have to sex it up. We can make huge promises with this uh, quantum information that we have, and we decided, you know, that we do not do that because in 10 years we are going to be presented a bill for this. And the problem we have is if we want to be serious and we want to say what it is about, which can be very exciting, very often this makes much more difficult to get attention. Okay? So I want to make propaganda for my field to get more funding, but not based on God. You want to be, yeah, you want to be responsible, and I think that's admirable, and I think that that actually uh, journalists are, uh, you know, are, are going to be more likely to want to listen to you because. Well, but that, there, is a, there is an inverse. Uh, sometimes it, that there is a reverse effect because kind of I don't have much experience with it, but some. So sometimes you try to talk to, to a person from the media, try to explain your, your stuff on an intellectual basis. Immediate question is how do, does it help solve health problems? So sometimes they provoke us to, to go into this kind of area because that of course beefs up the, the story. It's easy to say that the, the scientist X solved the problem and now we can cure cancer or whatever. This, and, and, so it's not entirely an adversary position, but sometimes it's, it's the other way around. And yeah. Pretending that all scientists are people of integrity and all reporters are the way uh, kind of. No, are. there's a but game that gets played. Is, there's a definitely, I mean, the way. It sometimes provoke us. Too. In the ideal universe, like we would all care about nothing but truth, and so there would be no conflicts ever. But I think, you know, the a question, that I, a better question to ask is really will this have applications, not what are the applications, because we don't really know that. And so that's kind of a loaded question saying, what are the applications of this as opposed to. Truth is, it has Did you have more slides? Um, I'm pretty much done. I mean, the, the only other point I was going to make about was sort of to, to go, go to the bottom of this, which is uh, that. Um, you know, the other the other thing is just uh, that, that can be really helpful for us is to consider our uh, journalists. Uh, you know, we're sort of in the process of kind of continuing education, and that uh, I really leaned on the scientific community when I was sort of dropped into the news section of science and had to cover particle physics and cosmology. And, and people actually spent a lot of time. People who were who weren't quoted in any of my stories just sort of teaching me their fields. And I, I actually felt like I learned more doing that job than I did in college in a way because. It was like having private lessons in science, and I had the, you know, the whole community to learn from. I didn't have to worry about what grade I was getting, so I could ask just about anything. You know? So, and I also think I was somehow I was a little bit more mature and in a better position to learn. Um, and and a lot of science reporters are in it partly because we like learning; it's fun for us, and so we really enjoy that. And um, you know, that happened again when I took on this evolution column that I really leaned on people in the evolutionary biology community to sort of uh, get me up to speed about some of the problems in their area and what they were thinking about. And people sort of, uh, you know, convinced me that I really should read uh, Darwin all the way through, which I did. And, uh, you know, convinced me when I got to that slow part in the middle, now I like, keep, keep going. <laughs> if you don't write an evolution column, you have to finish it. Um, and so, you know, that's part of the reason I'm here is because I think this is, you know, this is a really good opportunity for me to continue my education. And as I learn about some of these fields, like your field, that when when things come up, you know, in the news that might be related, that I'll know uh, how to turn, I'll know who to call and how to turn into a news story. And it really helps me to have an awareness of, of what's going on. And, you know, this is another problem in journalism that there used to be a lot of money uh, for travel, and I used to go to a lot of conferences, and I'd go follow scientists out in the field, and uh, you know, have a lot of direct contact. And now, as money is dried up, it's it's a lot harder for me to do that. So, so programs like this are really important because they they keep me from getting kind of disconnected from the scientific communities that I'm writing about. Thank you. Uh, sure. If people have more. Any more questions? Uh -huh. Yeah, a slightly even more general one than Mazos had about convince a journalist that science is At some point, somebody wanted to interview me, and then I looked up this TV show, and it was about aliens landing in oh. Peru. And I said, look, I mean, <laughs> Science is exciting. Why do you have to think of these things? But well, TV is a whole other thing, and I, you know, in a way, I think that the uh, that the press gets kind of a bad rap because we get 
can call it the media, we get kind of tied in. But, but I, you know, I, I don't really know the answer for television. I still think that, that print has some future and the web has a future uh, in doing responsible stuff. I'm not sure about television. Some good television. My favorite TV shows are all fiction. I think it's a great outlet for <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I want you to identify them. No, no, no. You know, I, um, I also think that uh, you know people actually really do. People love science. You know, people. I think that you know that public lecture the other night was packed, and people really like science. The problem people have is distinguishing real science from fake science, from pseudoscience, and that's that's tricky because the pseudoscientists know what people want. You know, they want NASA to find heaven, or they want you know they want aliens. So um, I think that's the more difficult. Part. It's not, people, people love science. Uh, a scientist uh, who got beat also in this connection because uh, there's a lot of speculation about entanglement and the for the, for the quantum mind and all that sort of thing, right? So, so I think many of us are really over doing better than the journalists in getting strange stories out. Yes, yeah. I mean, though in your field, there's just it can be difficult to understand and explain. Um, so it's, it's often more complex. It's actually just, it's every bit as interesting, but, but more complicated to get it right. So I'm wondering about follow-up stories. So for example, your two examples of arson and life, and um, the Antarctic meeting rights. That's not a big play, presumably, front and center on science pages, but then as the evidence started to Integrate the stories that well, really seem to come out. To yes. Follow it up. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, one of, some of my favorite stories were those follow up stories. I had one where I interviewed uh, Richard Zare, who was the, the Sanford chemist involved, and, and he gave me a great interview. And it was really interesting. I mean, he kind of made a U turn from that thing just in time so that it didn't tarnish him in any way. So as I, I told somebody else, having a little price that you know, made him a little uh, less vulnerable to that. But he said, you know, he. He got these rocks from NASA, and he didn't even know what they were. You know, they just said we want you to use your technique to get uh, his freedom figure that you can get the smallest traces of organic chemicals out. So I said we want you to just tell us what's in these. And they were actually labeled Minnie and Mickey, and then they sent him one labeled Goofy. And so, you know, he did this analysis, and then he later <laughs> told him what these rocks were, and he got really excited, you know, and, and wanted to join the team. But later, as he learned more about, you know, he, he ended up coming back and way more. So it was very interesting to sort of trace his, you know, his role in all this and, and see how it happened. And with arsenic, actually, I all of my stories were negative from the beginning, so I never had to backtrack. Well, oh, not so much asking about you. Yeah. Um, but other people, yeah, other people did sort of follow it up. I mean, I, I think there's ego involved sometimes. If you bought into something stupid, you don't want to have to it. There were a lot of stories about both of those that came out later. I mean, they're, they're different because the, the Mars Rock one, just I think it's still kind of hanging in limbo. You know, nobody really disproved it. They just sort of realized that there was no evidence one way or another and just kind of hanging there. But the arsenic thing really, I think, was, was put to final, its final resting place. At this point. Yeah, last question. Well, I, I think the point that he's trying to make, though, is when, the, when these big discoveries are made, they appear on the front page. And then if it's found out that they're wrong, there's a small little retraction or description of how it really isn't this way, and it appears in section B on page 15. Yes, I was going to say, well, journals often don't publish the negative. I'm not, I'm not faulting the press for this. I'm just saying I think this is the frustration: is that when you get you see the big headline that has the uh, this big discovery and all the hype, and then. The correction yes. comes out, yeah. you know, just get, doesn't, doesn't get the, the same exposure. Yeah, no, that's true. And that is why I wish all science, uh, all newspapers had science columnists. And yet, yeah, oh, really, I don't even know any of you right now. So, but they all should. All right, so I want to thank Faye again.